Well, good morning. If we haven't met yet, again, my name is Ron, and uh, welcome. Wow, this is great. If you're new to ENIAC, um, we're so glad that you're here. Um, and I want to extend in a welcome to this family, which has become family for us. And we pray that you find a place where you belong. So today we wrap up our May series surveying four of the 12 minor prophets, which conclude the Old Testament. Now, they're only minor in their size, but friends, they pack a punch. These, uh, these 12 books are pretty powerful, and there's nothing minor about their message. Uh, we've learned this month that the minor prophets share a common theme, return, repent, and be restored. Return to the promises of the covenant, repent of your sins, and be restored to your relationship with God and his blessing. And I pray that today is not a message that just helps you attain some more knowledge. But we've been praying that today you hear from God, like, even, like really hear from him. A word from him that he has something for each one of you today. And that you receive an invitation from him and that you can respond to him. I already believe we've been praying the Holy Spirit's been moving. Thank you, worship team. I was worked up. I almost lost my voice. Um, and uh, we pray that he will be here preparing your hearts. You probably wonder about those little pieces of paper. Those are not to take notes on because that would be a really tiny, you know, that's to write later in the, in, the, in the message. So hold on to that. So let's pray. Jesus, we invite you uh, to speak. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would be working in each of our hearts. And Father, we thank you that you call us your sons and daughters, that our identity is found in you. So we pray that you would have your way in these next few minutes, as you already have been in the service. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so this morning we're going to explore the first of the minor prophets, Hosea. Hosea. Hosea, not going to lie, this is one of the most dramatic and scandalous books. Scandalous in all of the Bible. In Hosea, there's a message about how God feels about us when we wander, how personally he takes it when we run from him, how he pursues us like the great hound of heaven. If you've ever read that poem, he's the great hound of heaven. He pursues us, he finds us, and he brings us back home to where we belong. Hosea is a powerful illustration about the kind of love that Jesus has for us, the kind of love that it doesn't make sense, it doesn't add up, and it doesn't have strings attached. I'm getting worked up already. It's the kind of love that we can't comprehend, we can't measure, and we can't fully appreciate. It's the kind of love that doesn't wait for us to clean up our act before he will love us. It's the kind of love that will go to go and go to whatever lengths it will take to bring us back, to buy us back, and to love us even when we don't deserve it. You ready for this? All right, so let's turn to Hosea chapter 14, starting in verse 1. You'll find Hosea just to the right of the book of Daniel, even though chronologically it happens before the exile, before the book of Daniel. So find Hosea, and then stand with me for the reading of the word. Um, I'm, I'm reading out of the um, New Living Translation because that's the Bible I have at home. So here we go. Everybody ready? All right. Hosea 14, verses 1 to 4. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for your sins have brought you down. Bring your confessions and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive, our, forgive all of our sins and graciously receive us so that we may offer you our praises. Assyria can't save us, nor can our war horses. Never again will we say to the idols we have made, you are our gods. No, in you alone do the orphans find mercy. The Lord says, then I will heal you of your faithfulness. My love will know no bounds, my, for my anger will be gone forever. You may be seated. So a little background, Hosea was one of the prophets to the northern kingdom of Israel in about the 8th century BC from about 785 to 725 was when he prophesied. The book opens around 750 to 760 BC. 
uh, uh, Google that. Um, I, I wasn't there, but that's, what the, that's what's out there. Before Assyria conquered Israel. Other prophets who were around that time were Amos, Joel, Micah, and Isaiah. And uh, they didn't get this hard assignment like Hosea got, as you'll find out very soon. Chapter 1, verse 1 tells us that Hosea prophesied during the years that Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah were kings of Judah, the southern kingdoms, and that when Jeroboam II was king of Israel in the northern kingdom, and that he primarily prophesied to the northern kingdom. When Hosea began his prophetic ministry, he would have seen Israel experience a great time of peace and prosperity. Under the reign of Jeroboam II, they had acquired great wealth like no other time in their recent history since the time of King Solomon. And like our culture today, life was comfortable. I mean, we're talking luxury model camels, you know, the kind with Bluetooth, <laughs> like three chariot garages, silk turbans and bedazzled sandals. I mean, life was comfortable. But like our culture, this wealth also can breed corruption. The priests and the leaders led their nation into moral and religious decay, lying, cheating, stealing, murder, social injustice, and sexual sin were rampant. And they aligned themselves with other nations. I mean, they were the chosen nation, and yet they aligned themselves with Assyria and Egypt for protection. And they traded the worship of the one true God, Yahweh, for the worship of other gods, gods like Baal, the Canaanite storm god, and Asherah, the Canaanite fertility goddess. I mean, these were nasty gods. And Israel, they ran. They ran from their first love. Israel betrayed their first love and sought after other lovers, other gods, other nations. And it was scandalous. Scandalous. And you know what? God took their sin personally. He took their sin personally. He was so grieved and so angered by their sin that he chose Hosea, whose name, by the way, his name means salvation. He chose Hosea to be a living illustration and used his story to show the lengths he would go to bring Israel back. Chapters 1 to 3 feature this illustration while chapters 4 to 14 feature the prophetic words that God spoke through Hosea to Israel. And this week, I highly encourage you to read all of Hosea. It'll make your skin crawl. I'm, so you're going to get a little of it today. But turn to chapter 1, verse 2, and note that I'm going to use another translated term for a word listed in the NLT for... Uh, a particular profession in sensitivity to little ears in the room and to make a point later, okay? So Hosea chapter 1, 2, it says, When the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, he said to him, Go and marry a promiscuous woman, so that some of her children will be conceived in her promiscuity. This will illustrate how Israel has acted like a promiscuous woman by turning against the Lord and worshiping other gods. Jonah was uh, told to go to Nineveh, and what did he do? He jumped on a boat and headed toward Tarshish. Hosea is told to go marry this woman, and he does. Let's talk about obedience. So Hosea marries a woman named Gomer. Yep, that's her name. <laughs> Gomer. And she bears him three children, likely from three different men from her promiscuity. The first was a son whom the Lord said to him, name him Jezreel, which means judgment is coming. You know, we've spent a lot of time picking our kids' names, and that was not one of them. <laughs> hey, judgment is coming, but judgment is coming, and judgment was coming to the nation. The second was a daughter named Lo-Rohama, which means not loved or not mercy. Girls, do you want to be named that? Not loved, no mercy. And the third child was another son named Lo Ami, which means not my people, not my people. Let this sink in. Hosea likely sought out his wife in a brothel, 
a scandalous woman, one that the neighborhood, they would have known. He marries her, and she bears him three children. Judgment is coming, not loved, not my people. Daily reminders to Hosea about how God felt about Israel. And God used this scandalous illustration to demonstrate how far Israel had sinned and how he felt about it and what the consequences would be. Listen to some of the charges. And again, I encourage you to read this this week. These are just a few of how Israel sought after other lovers and how God took it personally. Listen to the language. Listen to the heart of God. Here's a few of them. This is the first one's from Hosea chapter 2. I will punish her for all those times when she burned incense to her images of Baal, when she put on her earrings and jewels and went out to look for her lovers, but forgot all about me, says the Lord. Here's one from chapter four. They ask a piece of wood for advice. They think a stick can tell them the future. Longing after idols has made them foolish. They have played the promiscuous woman serving other gods and deserting their God. Can you feel his hurt? Can you feel his betrayal? Here's another one from chapter seven. They do not cry out to me with sincere hearts. Instead, they sit on their couches and wail. They were so wealthy, they had couches. They sit on their couches and wail. They cut themselves, begging foreign gods for grain and new wine, and they turn away from me. I train them to make them strong. At now... They plot evil against me. Here's from chapter 10. How prosperous Israel is. How a luxuriant vine loaded with fruit. But the richer the people get, the more pagan altars they build. The more bountiful their harvest, the more beautiful their sacred pillars. Hosea 10 and chapter 12. The people of Israel feed on the wind. They chase after the east wind all day long. They pile up lies and violence. They are making an alliance with Assyria while sending olive oil to buy support from Egypt. And the last one I'll share with, two more. Chapter 12. But no, the people are like crafty merchants selling from dishonest scales. They love to cheat. Israel boasts, I'm rich. I've made a fortune all by myself. No one has caught me cheating. My record is spotless. And the last one, you are about to be destroyed, O Israel. Yes, by me, your only helper. Now, where is your king? Let him save you. Where are all the leaders of the land, the kings and the officials you demanded of me? In my anger, I gave you kings, and in my fury, I took them away. So yeah, God took their sin personally. He was betrayed. He had it up to here. For all God did for them, like Gomer, Israel threw it all away. And yet, in his anger, he did not give up on them. This is going to be good news, okay? Hang in there with me. He did not give up on them. God remained faithful by his own covenant, which Sam shared in great detail last week. Thank you, Sam. The covenant. The covenant. God's covenant love has no bounds. His covenant love has no bounds. I'm not making this stuff up. Look at chapter 14, verse 4. The Lord says, Then I will heal you of your faithfulness. My love will know no bounds, for my anger will be gone forever. God used Hosea's own marriage as a living demonstration of this covenant that has no bounds. And this kind of love is nothing short of scandalous. This kind of love. Hop back to chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Then the Lord said to me, go and love your wife again, even though she commits adultery with another lover. This will illustrate that the Lord still loves Israel, even though the people have turned to other gods and love to worship them. So I bought her back. For 15 pieces of silver and five bushels of barley and a measure of wine. Honey, you're worth a lot more than that. I, I don't know what that's worth, but it's probably worth a lot. And then I said to her, you must live in my house for many days and stop your promiscuity. During this time, you will not have sexual relations with anyone, not even with me. 
And this shows that Israel will go a long time without a king or prince, without sacrifices, sacred pillars, priests, or even idols. But afterward, here comes good news. Afterward, the people will return and devote themselves to the Lord, their God, and to David's descendant, their king. In the last days, they will tremble in awe of the Lord and of his goodness. Gomer was bought back. She was bought back. She was bought back. She was bought back and she was brought back. Gomer was bought back and she was brought back. She would no longer be defined by that name. The one everybody knew about. By that shameful sin that she could feel. And no longer would her children be defined by their shameful names. Ooh, this is good news. Go back to chapter 1, starting in verse 10. Chapter 1, verse 10. Yet the time will come when Israel's people will be like the sands of the seashore, too many to count. Then at the place where they were told, you are not my people, it will be said, you are the children of the living God. Then the people of Judah and Israel will unite together. They will choose one leader for themselves. Jesus is coming. And they will return from exile together. What a day that will be. The day of Jezreel when God will again plant his people in the land. In that day, you will call your brothers Ami, my people. And you will call your sister Rahama, the ones I love. God's covenant love, a love with no bounds, says no longer will your sin define you. God's covenant love, a love with no bounds, says no longer will your sin define you anymore. Gomer, no longer are you a promiscuous woman. You are my wife. Children, you're no longer going to have names of condemnation now your very names will be the names of life. Jezreel, which now means God plants. Ami, my people. Rohama, the one I love. Your sin does not define you anymore. Good. Saw the band come up. Friends, this is good news. It's really good news. Like I said in the introduction, Hosea is a powerful illustration of the kind of love that Jesus has for us. It's the kind of love that, like I said, doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. It doesn't have strings attached. It's the kind of love we can't comprehend, we can't measure, we can't fully appreciate. It's the kind of love that doesn't wait for us to clean up our act. He came after me when I couldn't clean up my act. On a beach in New Jersey, 21 years old, I was drunk as a skunk. <laughs> um, and he came after me. He said, Ron, I'm not going to wait for you to clean up your act. I came for you, and I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to buy you back. It's the kind of love that will go to whatever length it will take to buy us back, even when we don't deserve it. Paul talks about this in... Romans 5 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While you were still a sinner, he died for you. He died for me. That's scandalous. So we praise our God, he says, and Paul talks about this in Ephesians. We praise our God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He's so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom. He bought us back with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He showered us with his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. What is more scandalous than God having a prophet marry a promiscuous woman? How about the father 
How about the Father sending his one and only Son, the perfect one, to this earth to live a perfect life, to die for you and I who are no different than Gomer. We're no different than Israel. Each of us has sinned. And every time we do, it's like we chase after that other lover. And when we sin, I'm just going to be real, we commit spiritual adultery against God. And God takes our sin personally. And God took our sin personally. He who knew no sin, he took it, all that sin and shame upon himself on the cross. God's covenant love for you has no bounds. There's no greater love than his love, than Jesus' love. He went to hell and back to bring you back. He purchased you with his life. You were dead in your sins. You were an enemy of God. You were called not loved. You were called not my people. But because of Jesus, whose name means Savior, he said, you are my people. You are loved. And friend, son, daughter, your sin does not define you anymore. Can I say it enough times? Can you hear it enough from him? Your sin does not define you anymore. Let's listen again to the text we read at the beginning. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for your sins have brought you down. Bring your confessions and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive our sins and graciously receive us that we may offer you our praises. Assyria cannot save us, nor can our war horses. Never again will we say to the idols we have made, you are our gods. No, in you alone do the orphans find mercy. The Lord says, then I will heal you of your faithlessness. My love will know no bounds, for my anger will be gone forever. So as you came in, you were given a scrap of paper. And it's a scrap of paper because it's going to be thrown out and burned in my backyard today. Okay? Can't wait for that. I wanted to do it on here, but I think if Andrew came back and found that we burned the church down, I don't think that would be such a good thing. So on that scrap of paper, respond to God by writing one word. Okay? One word. That word may be a word of repentance. Something that you're trusting in other than God. Something that you know you need to turn from to come back to your first love. I believe the Holy Spirit's already been speaking to you about that. What might that word be? That thing. I was praying about this week and he's like, Ron, it's a lot of things. So <laughs> I get very distracted, ask Sharon, by shiny things. And Jesus was like, come back, Ron, to your first love. It may be one thing, you might write other things, but come back. Or that one word may be a word of restoration, a shameful sin that has defined you in your past that you can't forgive yourself for. You know, that, that word that you keep hearing from the enemy, and you're like, I've repented of that. Uh, and he keeps whispering it back to you. Oh, no, 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 no. That grace, that's not for you. That's for those other people. What is that? That sin that you, you can't forgive yourself for. And Jesus already has. Write that word down. A word of repentance or a word of restoration. And as the worship team plays the last song and prayer team, you're welcome, please, to come up here. When you're ready... Come forward and drop that word in the wastebasket. Again, it's going to get burned. When we were praying before the service, Mark was saying, you know, when things get burned, wasteful things, they become lighter. We let it go. The things that are pure, like jewels, they get refined. But the things that are wasteful, they get burned up and they become lighter. I pray that today is a day will be lighter for you. The Lord says... 
I will heal you of your faithfulness. My love will know no bounds, for my anger will be gone forever. Now, maybe today you're here and you've never fully received the love and forgiveness of Jesus. You've been chasing after things that you believe give you life, but they don't. And again, I was there. I chased after a lot of things. Jesus already came for you. He already gave his life for you, that you will have life. So come home, friend. Come home today. Repent, return, be restored. That's what we've been talking about all month. Accept his love. Put your trust in him alone and receive your true identity in the family of God. On the cross, Jesus took your sin personally. His covenant love for you has no bounds. Your sin does not define you anymore. So come home. Come home to where you belong. Sam will later give you that opportunity. But for now, go ahead and write that one word down, that word of repentance, that word of restoration. And when you're ready, throw it away and come home.